Hi everybody and welcome back to our discussion on chapter 15, body composition and sports nutrition. Um, so the first thing I want to point out is this is an incredibly dense chapter. You're going to have to spend some time really digging in on your own to make sure you fully understand the concepts we're going to discuss here today. Um, so this kind of comes in two distinct parts. The first one is how do we assess body composition and then how do we fuel for appropriate performance. So our first topic will be body composition. So there are several different ways to measure body composition. Um, you have densiometry or underwater weighing, um, DEXA scans, um, air plethysmography or the BOD pod, skin folds and biological impedance. And these all have pros and cons. Um, so for example, underwater weighing used to be considered the gold standard. Um, and it is incredibly accurate um, in terms of how well it works. It works based off of density and Archimedes principle. So if you know the weight of the object and then we put it um, in water, we see how much volume it displaces. And then once we have the density, we can use some algorithms to figure out the body's density and therefore predict the body fat percentage. Um, so pros very accurate, cons it's very uncomfortable to do. Um, an individual is going to have to go underwater and it completely expel all of the air in their lungs and then they have to sit perfectly still. Um, if you are very good at underwater weighing as the subject, um, you can be done in as little as 10 trials. If you're inexperienced, you may be doing this 30 and 40 times just to get a good average score, which can be incredibly uncomfortable for the individuals that are participating. Um, so the very similar process is going to be the air plethysmography um, or utilizing the bod pod. Um, this uses the same density concepts, but instead of going underwater, you're going to use air pressure. Um, still finding the density of the body, plugging it into specified equations, and then um, figuring out an estimate of the body fat percentage from there. Um, still have the issues with the lungs here. Um, individuals that hold their breath or breathe abnormally can throw off our estimates. Um, also, when you do this, you have to be wearing very skin tight clothing, caps over the hair to make sure you have the smoothest surface possible to work with this. So those are our two density based measurements. Um, our next one is the DEXA. Um, this uses uh, x-rays. Um, and the cool thing about DEXA is it gives us the ability to look at body fat percentages throughout the entire body, not just an overall number. So I can get a body fat percentage of the arms, the torso, the legs, um, which gives us some important information in terms of where is somebody holding body fat. Additionally, it will also give us information about someone's bone density, um, which is very important, especially with women and older women in the risk of osteoporosis, osteoporosis and osteopenia. Um, our next one I want to talk about is biological impedance. Um, so this uses a two-factor model um, and it kind of does the assumption um, uh, that muscle mass holds lots of water and fat mass does not um, because we know uh, fat is hydrophobic. Um, basically here it's going to send a small electrical current all the way through your body um, and usually you have two hand measures. Sometimes you stand on your feet. So we have those special scales nowadays that estimate your body fat um, that you can get at any Target, Walmart, any store, anywhere. Um, and that is biological impedance or BIA. Um, downsides to this, if you were dehydrated, it's really gonna mess up your uh, score. Um, usually there's somewhere between a two and 6% error. Um, sometimes as little as two to 4% error using biological impedance. This is usually what we use at gyms. It's quick, it's easy, very low risk, and easy to deal with. And then the last one is skin folds. So skin folds have the benefit of being incredibly portable and relatively accurate. However, the downside of this is it is really easy to get administrative error. So the person doing the skin fold tests, if they are not well trained and well practiced, they can very rapidly overestimate or underestimate somebody's body fat percentage. Um, so this only really works if you're very well trained. Also, it's kind of uncomfortable. Somebody is pinching you really hard um, and places like your thighs 
where the skin and the fat tissue and the muscle are all very tightly packed against each other, it's going to be kind of uncomfortable to get pinched that hard. Um, so there are pros and cons to all of these. Um, one thing I would like to point out on here is you do not see BMI listed as an option. That is because body mass index or the BMI does not actually tell us anything about somebody's body composition. Um, it is a ratio of someone's height to their weight. Um, and it kind of gives us a classification structure for whether somebody is underweight, normal weight, overweight, or obese. Um, but it doesn't actually tell me anything about their comp body composition. Um, there can always be exceptions uh, when we're looking at BMI. So for example, if you have an individual that is a football player that is 6'2 and 295, super fit, their body composition is going to look very different than an individual that's also 6'2 and 295 and has never left the couch. Um, that is why the BMI does not actually tell us anything about body composition. BMI is fabulous on a population level. So identifying individuals that have specific risk factors if I'm looking at the whole population. However, if I'm bringing this down to a single individual, it does not work very well. Um, so notice BMI is not on here. Do not put BMI as body composition. All right, so this is gonna transition us to kind of a taboo topic. Um, and this is about weight standards in sports. Um, usually in sport, ha knowing your body composition is going to help you kind of adjust your performance. Um, but some sports have specific weight standards like weight classes. So wrestling, powerlifting, um, sometimes in cheerleading, uh, if you're going to be a flyer, you can't be over a certain weight. Um, so lots of sports kind of have these standards. However, there are pros and cons to having these weight standards. So um, it can be beneficial to make sure somebody that is uh, not abnormally sized is competing against somebody that is average sized in a particular weight class, trying to make things fair. Um, however, when we use things like weight standards, like you need to weigh under 150 pounds as a female to be a good pole holder. Um, you, you do need to be lighter to fly, if we're being honest, um, but that can put unhealthy and unrealistic body standards um, on certain individuals. So weight standards have their benefits, but they can be especially dangerous if they are applied incorrectly. Um, so coaches shouldn't necessarily always have weigh-ins. Like you can't be a good soccer player if you weigh on over this number. Um, that is not a healthy application of a weight standard. Um, making sure that somebody is wrestling in the 189 weight class is not 198 pounds. That would be a good application of a weight standard to make sure things are as fair as possible. Um, so love them or hate them, weight standards are kind of a fact of life in certain sports, but you want to use them as healthfully and safely as possible. All right, so how do we actually maintain these kind of standards and our body composition? And that's going to bring us into basic nutrient breakdown that is required to be, uh, to, to just be a successful athlete. Um, so when we look at this, the general recommendations for athletes are carbohydrates should make up somewhere between 55 and 60% of the nutrition that's brought in. Fats should be around 30% or less, and protein should make up somewhere between 10 and 15% of the calories consumed. So another way to look at this, depending on your level of activity, is carbohydrates should make up somewhere between three and 12 grams per kilogram, and protein should make up somewhere between 1.2 and 1.7 grams per kilogram consumed of your calories per day. So what does this actually mean? Um, when we are participating in physical activity, it's very important to consume an adequate amount of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins to be able to be at your best performance. Um, so we know consuming carbohydrates before about a physical activity, if it is a lower glycemic uh, snack kind of thing, or we're normal glycemic anyways, this can help improve sports performance. Also, if you are participating in carbohydrate loading, um, so things like the distance runners always go eat pasta the night before the race. Um, it's actually more beneficial to eat that pasta three days before the race, but details. Um, so things like this are going to help improve performance. 
However, we can also supplement carbohydrates incorrectly. Um, so going into a bout of physical activity fully fasted um, is going to strip our glycogen stores, which can actually impede performance um, if we're doing endurance type activities. Um, so things like fasted cardio have their pros and their cons. Um, when you're doing fasted cardio, you're not trying to get your best performance. You're probably trying to utilize free fatty acids. So we're now looking for optimal performances out of fasted cardio. Um, also, if you consume high glycemic index snacks before participating in physical activity, so like having a Snickers before practice is probably not going to help you very much because you'll have the big sugar up and then the big crash. Um, so, and then just not having an appropriate consumption of carbohydrates will damage your performance. Um, looking into fats. So uh, consuming high fatty foods before participating in physical activity um, the first kind of no-no on that one is it's going to usually cause GI distress. Um, <clears throat> so you don't want to consume very fatty things like dairy, um, high fat uh, meat products, things like that before physical activity because they can make you nauseous and upset your stomach. Uh, so the first thing about that also, if you have a high fat diet, kind of like a ketogenic diet, and then you go to perform physical activity, the pro of this is that you're going to have lots and lots of mobilized free fatty acids circulating to give you high amounts of energy. The downside of this though is because you're just consuming uh, high fats and very low carbohydrates, you're going to have decreases in your glycogen stores. And when your glycogen stores are depleted, you kind of don't have the pop when you go to participate in physical activity. Um, so you'll kind of struggle with those quick bursts, but you'll be able to participate in physical activity for long periods of time. Um, so pros and cons to fat um, before and after exercise. And then finally with proteins, proteins before your workout are not necessarily the big deal. It is after your workout that they're absolutely essential. Um, so within two hours of completing a bout of physical activity, you should consume a high carbohydrate, high protein snack or meal. Um, this is going to help replenish your glycogen stores, work in the rebuilding, of your muscles and help you kind of recover from that bout of physical activity. Um, consuming adequate amounts of protein in general is going to be essential for sports performance. This is because um, if you're an endurance athlete, you may be using protein for fuel. And if you're a strength athlete, you will absolutely be using protein as a rebuilding structure. Proteins are our enzymes, there are hormones, there are structural building blocks. They need to be around and available to help with performance. So with all of that in mind, we also need to consider um, our vitamin and mineral intake, um, making sure we have adequate uh, vitamins. So like our B vitamins are gonna be essential for metabolism. Vitamin C is gonna be essential for metabolizing iron and strengthening our immune system. Um, vitamin E is going to be a great antioxidant. Um, vitamin D is also going to have a role with calcium, which is one of our essential minerals. Um, iron is another essential mineral that's going to be with our hemoglobin and our myoglobin to help circulate oxygen throughout the body. Um, and phosphorus is also going to be highly essential because it hangs out with calcium in our bones, which calcium is also important for uh, nervous system, nerve conduction um, and action potentials. It's going to be essential to muscle contraction and also our general bone health. So with all of that in mind, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, and minerals, we also need to be very involved in how much water and electrolytes we are consuming. Um, so water is essential to performance. Our body is made up of somewhere between 45 and 65% water, depending on your age and hydration levels. Um, so having enough of it is going to be very important. Um, so kind of a rule of thumb, about two hours before you participate in physical activity, and you consume for somewhere between 400 and 600 milliliters of water. And then what you need to drink is got to keep you within 2% of your uh, body weight when you started the physical activity. When we start to participate in physical activity, you're going to start to sweat, to participate in evaporative cooling. And if you start to lose more than 2% of your body weight, you start to get dangerously dehydrated. Um, and then we start dealing with things, especially if it's hot, like heat stroke, heat cramps, and heat exhaustion. Um, so try to stay within that, keep yourself hydrated within that level. 
it's not like we can exactly stop a game and say, hey, hang on a second, I have to weigh myself and see if I'm losing this. Um, so usually you can kind of guesstimate uh, about 50 um, milliliters of water uh, per 30 minutes to 60 minutes of physical activity is a good way to phrase that. So if you're thirsty, drink. If you're not thirsty, sip a little bit of something, but keep yourself hydrated. All right, and then finally, your essential job when you are done is to replace anything you have lost. That means water and electrolytes. Um, how you can replace your electrolytes. Um, you can consume sports beverages like Gatorade, Powerade. Um, they have carbohydrates, um, which is straight sugar. So if you didn't do anything particularly taxing, you probably don't need the sugar, um, but you need the salt and the water. Um, you can consume things like Pedialyte, which is kind of my preferred drink. It doesn't have quite as much sugar as Gatorade, uh, but for the physical activity I participate in, I don't need all the sugar. Um, you can also do simple electrolyte solutions like Gator Lights, um, or you can drink things uh, like coconut water, which is very helpful. Or you can go hardcore like some of the Highland Games athletes that literally put pink Himalayan rock salt in their hand, lick their hand, and then chug a bottle of water. That is disgusting, but it works. So how you choose to replenish yourself with water and electrolytes when you're done is going to be very essential because if you don't have electrolytes and you're not adequately, adequately hydrated, none of this over here matters. So hopefully you enjoyed this brief discussion on um, physical activity, body composition, and sports performance with basic nutrition information. And I look forward to seeing you guys for our discussion on chapter 16. Have a good day. Bye.